Advertising was actually sort of a second choice for me. Um, the really odd part of my story is that when I went to college, when I just graduated high school and I was only 18 years old, I took a test that was to determine you know, where my interests were, who, what professions I matched up with. And advertising, amazingly enough, was the number one thing. But I didn't take advertising classes. And I went to college and I played the drums and rock bands. And it wasn't until after seven years after college that I decided to hang up my drumsticks and get into advertising. So um, it was quite amazing that I ended up in the place where that test told me I should end up when I was 18 years old. <laughs> I wasted about 12 years in the meantime, but uh, so that's how I got there basically. And I took a job in an ad agency not even knowing that there was such a thing as a creative department. I thought you just get in an ad agency and you make ads. Um, so I, I was in the production department actually, and I uh, sort of worked my way up from there. I don't think you can say Steve spent uh, more time in one thing than another, really. Uh, in fact, I would guess that he spent more time with the products, but he spent a lot of time with the marketing, and far more so than any other CEO I've ever seen. You know, normally a big company hires a marketing chief, and they do their thing, and then at the very end of the process, you'll you'll share it with the CEO to get a final approval. Uh, and Steve was the advertising guy. He had a vice president of advertising, of marketing, but that person uh, was in the room and would help make decisions, but everyone knew that Steve was the guy who made the decision. So he was very, very active in marketing. Uh, I know he had a passion for it. He, he thoroughly enjoyed it, and I do think that, uh, and I saw evidence of it, I don't think he ever conceived a product without thinking about how the marketing would go. It was all one thing to him, a product that would fit in people's lives somehow, and here's how we would explain it to them. I think the two work together, but I think in the end it's the devices. And I, it, one of the things that always bugs me, because there are a lot of people out there with anti-Apple feelings, and, and one of the popular arguments is that it's all marketing and that the products are terrible. I think the products are fantastic and the marketing um, exists to throw more fuel on the flame, shall we say. Um, great marketing doesn't turn a bad product into a hit. I mean, a product has to be great. So I think uh, Steve Jobs' magic was having everything work together. Uh, and you could see that at one of his product launches. He'd be on stage, he would announce the product, and as people were literally leaving the convention center, all the, the streets of the city would suddenly be alive with posters of the product and the television stations would be running the commercials and um, it was all one big harmonious, you know, well orchestrated effort. My, my personal best marketing moment, I suppose you would have to say, is the I. Um, I didn't think that the I was going to become nearly as big as it did <laughs> become. I, um, you know, it was just a job, name a product, and we put a lot of effort into it. And iMac was one of the first names I came up with, and it felt right for many reasons. And there's a whole story about how Steve did not like it at first, and we had to present it two times, and he still didn't like it, and it sort of just became the name because it, it just started to uh, feel better, I think, after all those meetings. But um, uh, I think for all the, the hard work I might have done on one campaign or another, it's that little I <laughs> that you know, resonated and became so big uh, that is you know, a personal you know, moment of pride for me that I was able to contribute that. Um, again, no idea it was gonna be big at the time. It's one of those lucky things. At the time, you just think, oh, I came up with a name. Uh, so I didn't know it was going to get big. Steve didn't know it was going to get big. You know, we didn't have anything but computers at the time. There were no iDevices. There were no iPods or anything like that at the time. So um, nobody could really see where that was going. But it's kind of fun to see that it grew into what it did. Well, 
Um, to keep it in the realm of Apple, I would say the Power Mac G4 Cube, which um, a lot of people talk about as one of Apple's great failures. And there's a whole failure story that goes along with that. You know, the computer came out, it was gorgeous. It's in the Museum of Modern Art. Um, you know, it was unlike anything anybody had ever seen. It was just a cube, an eight inch cube with a CD that came off the top like that. And um, it was just gorgeous, but um, it was overpriced. So it wasn't really like, you know, our fault, the marketing people. Um, there was a meeting one day that I'll always remember where Steve came in uh, kind of uh, white. You know, he was, it looked like someone close to him had just passed away or something. It was a, a horrible thing uh, that he had just had a meeting on the Cube and was told that they couldn't get the price below $17.99 in dollars. And he wanted it to be like $14.99. It was supposed to be a little higher than an iMac. Um, it wasn't supposed to be like a pro machine, and yet they couldn't get the price down. So he knew it was a terrible problem from the start. Um, and probably because of that, Steve was much more sensitive, it seemed, to the advertising that we created. And I have never in my life created so many ads for a single product. There were over 50 versions of commercials for the Power Mac G4 Cube. Um, and Steve just hated one after the next. And we had some really good ones in there. He had something in his head, um, and we finally got something on the air, and the computer didn't really sell anyway because it was too expensive. So it was a beautiful machine, but it will go down in history as an Apple failure, unfortunately. I think Steve actually did not really want to make a big thing of himself. There were a lot of times we would make certain decisions about his role in something, and he was kind of shy about it and didn't want his presence to take away from what the product was. I think his focus was always the product. So if we suggested that he ever inject himself into that, he wasn't crazy about it. And one great example of that is the Think Different commercial that we started with. The, commercial called uh, The Crazy Ones. We wanted Steve to be the voiceover for it because we thought he, he had the passion for what we were saying. And he resisted that because he didn't want to be a distraction. He didn't want people to be debating amongst themselves why this egomaniac was presenting himself. He wanted to hire a good actor who would do the voice and it would tell the Apple story without him getting in the way. So I think he... Oh, and there's another good example for you, actually, back in the days of Next. Um, we actually did talk him into being on the cover of one of the pieces we created for it. And he fought, but at that time the Next computer was failing, and um, he, he was having trouble creating the, you know, the, the initial excitement that he wanted to. And we actually talked him into being on the screen of the computer, there was like a portrait of Steve Jobs selling you know, his new Next computer. That didn't work either, actually, but um, that was one moment where we actually convinced him to step into the limelight to try to sell something. I think I learned a lot from Steve Jobs that has that I've applied in other uh, projects that I've taken on with other companies, and, and there, there are a few of them, but you know, the things I talk about mostly are, are focus. Um, a lot of advertisers try to say too many things. You know, I think we were pretty effective with Apple at minimizing the messages and trying to say one thing and say it really well, and it's one of those lessons that is very difficult uh, for companies to buy into because they think, well, there are five amazing things about our product. We've got to say them all. But when you say five things in a commercial, it's harder to rem remember any one of them as opposed to making a great spot about the one feature. So obviously there are ways to, to uh, play that differently and <clears throat> different degrees of success. But it's really about the clarity of the brief, I think. That's always an important point, like exactly who are you talking to, and what is the one thing that's going to turn those people on? Um, and it is about storytelling as well. You know, what's the, 
what are you saying to people that, that they're going to relate to and that, that's going to keep them interested from start to finish? And how does something apply to their lives or whatever? I think too many people, too many companies, too many marketers rely on product features and they, they sort of list them um, and they don't try hard enough to engage. And I think that's been a strength of Apple is, is showing people things that make them go, wow, I'd really like to try that one, you know. Uh, and, you know, granted, not every product in the world can do that. If you're talking about a, you know, a, a detergent for your washer, it's, it's a little hard. Um, but there are a lot of great detergent commercials out there as well, too, that find a way to connect with people about cleanliness in their life or, you know, whatever it is you're trying to, to sell, um, as opposed to simply saying, our wash will be 20% brighter than that wash kind of thing. It feels very cold. So uh, my advice to people is always find that, that human connection. What's going to, you know, what's the, what's the thing that everyone's going to get very quickly and it will sort of strike to the heart and make you feel an emotional connection with the company. And over time, if you do that enough, you get to be like an Apple because people are so attached to Apple that it's hard to pry them loose, really. And that's one of the great things about Apple. They have a, a core of customers who, who talk about how happy they are to their friends and their families and their colleagues. And that's what you want to create is a brand that people love. As I said, I am working on a new book. The first one was about Apple and how it um, was obsessed with simplicity and how that translated to success. The next book is about how companies all around the world are doing that. Because it isn't just Apple. There are an awful lot of great business leaders who, who understand that, that simplicity is a way to reach people. But it's also a way, it's a way to design products. It's a way to talk to customers. It's a way to organize a company. You know, you're, you're working in a complicated company and you, um, you get frustrated. And that's what makes people want to leave. So simplicity shows up in so many different places. And, and the leaders who, who really leverage the power of simplicity seem to be succeeding more. Or, or as they do succeed, they do so by connecting more deeply with their customers because simplicity is a, a basic value we all have. I mean, nobody would purposefully choose a more complicated way to do something they could do in a simpler way. So I think when companies sort of streamline their operations, so people, ref you know, there are fewer layers of approvals, when you design products so they're simpler and people don't have to read manuals, you know, when you create advertising that says one thing and says it really well, I mean, all these things together are what made Apple so successful and I think to different degrees, there are a lot of people out there employing the power of simplicity to, to do great things for their, for their businesses, for their customers, for themselves. So there's a lot of it out there and I'm trying to uh, find it out so I can write about it. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to do that by the time my deadline gets here. <laughs>